What's up, fellow nerds? Welcome back to another Sunday episode of the Inking Out Loud podcast. For episode 23, we're continuing on with Brandon Sanderson's YA trilogy, The Reckoners, or the second installment, Firefight. I am Rob Santos, joined once again by my co-host, Drew McCaffrey. How's it going, everybody? And making another return, a special guest, Mr. Jared Livingston. What's up, everyone? Jared, I don't know why, but I always want to add like a mister to your name every time I say it. I did it once, and now I just can't stop. It is, I, I think... get Dr. Livingston, I presume, quite a bit. Yeah, Dr. Livingston. That's also, it's yeah. got such a nice ring to it. There's so many things you can do with that last name. So I think going <laughs> forward, I just might say mister or doctor or captain just like any time. I'll just mix it up here and there. Sound good? Hey, man. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so... Uh, Let's talk about Firefight. Drew, last week you mentioned during our Steelheart discussion that this is um, on your previously mentioned top tier of Sanderson. You want to tell us a little Second bit more? Second to top, but yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's, that's right. You said Words of Radiance Oathbringer. Sorry. But as far as yeah. like his oh. YA, yeah, this is top tier for you. What exactly yeah. did you mean by that? Uh, give us a little more context. Uh, well, so it's two maiden things. Um a, I love just the plot. I love the sequence of events in this book. I love the setting and the way uh, Sanderson uses this like drowned version of New York City to raise the stakes, to you know uh, bring a new sort of dynamic to the Reckoners' fight against these epics. I loved the climax, especially. I, I mean, everything with like the revelation of what calamity is and how the Reckoner's weaknesses really work, and, uh, and and then Prof and Megan and all of that at the end, I, I really, really like that. But what really sets this book apart, because lots of Brandon Sanderson's books have awesome settings and awesome plots, and like, that's, you know, kind of... Yeah, it's like a hallmark he's known of Sanderson. For these, yep. You know, these Sanderson avalanches, these crazy climaxes. But what sets this book apart is the character development. And it is specifically, for me... Megan, mm. uh, it, she, I, I may have mentioned this on, on the Steelheart episode, but she is like a top three character for Brandon Sanderson, in my opinion. Like, Sweet. I, I love her character. She's compelling. She's dynamic. She's by no means boring. I mean, she's, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I really enjoy her relationship with David. I, I like the obstacles that, Brandon put in their way. I like the way he uh, he set up their distinct personalities and played them off of each other. I mean, they're they're just <laughs> there. There's so many things about Megan that I love, hmm. and 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 you know we'll, we'll get to this a little later. But there's one scene in particular that I think is one of Brandon's finest bits of writing as far as relationships go in this book. Sweet, Jared. What about you, man? How did you find this compared to Steelheart? Uh, I like it better than Steelheart for sure. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked the dynamic in Babylon or New Babylon, whatever we're calling this, <laughs> as, as compared Babylar, to uh, yeah. compared to New Cago. Yeah, it's still a better name than New Cago. <laughs> I <laughs> yes, I agree with so. that. Uh, I liked Regalia, and I kind of liked the the. Um, the new dynamic with her as opposed to Steelheart. Sure. She's much more subtle in the way she does things, but she's still a great antagonist that you're kind of afraid of. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I mentioned last episode that I I think I found the reason that I like Steelheart so much. Or it might, it might not have been last episode. Now that I think on it, it was during our Mitosis episode, which we actually recorded in between... Steelheart and Firefight, but that's going to be a Patreon exclusive, that one. But I mentioned in that episode, I think I found the reason why I like Steelheart so much, and Drew, you prefer Firefight. And I think you kind of just confirmed it for me a, a minute or two ago. And for really? me, I wrote down that it, I think it was the difference between spectacle and setting versus the intimate kind of character study that we got with this one. P particularly, yeah. like <laughs> you mentioned, uh, with the relationship... Um, between David and Megan, David and Prof, you know, David's kind of relationship with himself as he's questioning his uh, his whole identity. I mean, we see at the very mm -hmm. beginning where uh, he's leaving New Cargo and he says to himself, who am I if I'm not in New Cargo? And this is something that he has to discuss or not discuss, sorry, discover as he, you know, kind of 
gets plucked out of the only home he's ever known and tossed into this spectacular kind of aesthetically awesome but totally intimidating environment that is, you know, Babylar. Our new, you know, new Babylar. I can't, re I'm always getting so f uh, <laughs> mixed up with these names. Babylar. I'll just call it Babylar, yeah. And I, and I keep wanting to say Babar for some reason, which is that stupid elephant from the kids show. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so how did I nail it? Was it just the difference between, like, spectacle and oh my god and, and, and crazy uh, setting versus, like, that kind of intimate, that intimate character study that uh, you're so partial yeah. to? Yeah. Um, I, I, not that there isn't spectacle and an awesome setting. Oh, in definitely Firefly, not. Definitely uh, not. But to it's, say. It, it is the, it is the, like, more profound character moments and, and I think better character development in this that pushes it over the top. And the con, I think the conflict feels more personal to the characters. Oh yeah, personal. Well, I mean, is, does it get As much in... more personal than hunting down your father's <laughs> killer, though? Mm, conflict between the characters. I guess that's kind of a trope, though. Now that I think on it, but uh, let's let's talk about the prologue because I think that's a nice, you know, jumping off point there. The, and, and especially for me, how different the two prologues were. I mean, if you take Steelheart, the one previously, just, you know, it was a huge prologue. I think it was actually the longest chapter in the book. We had our whole premise outlined for us. We had, uh, you know, like the, the, the epics explained. We had their, their weaknesses explained. We, we learned about our character and what the entire kind of overall arching heist, I guess, for the book it's going to be. But for a firefight, we just got like, what was it, a page? I mean, I was listening to the audiobook, so it was just like a minute. We got, you know... This, uh, I mean, this the, the rising of calamity, awesome. The entire city bathed in red light, really cool. But then it, it just is, ended. It is less than a page. So. Less than a page. It was like just like a few boom. paragraphs, right? And it boom. just ended yeah. immediately. It is such a difference between how it, uh, this one starts off and Steelheart, you know. Um, and then of course they have the last line that I kind of just groaned at, and it said, "Then the screaming started," and I went, uh. <laughs> Damn. I mean, is, is there anyone on this planet Earth who hasn't written a scene that ends with those exact words? I, I definitely have before myself. I didn't realize Ooh. how kind of... I, I actually think I have, too. I'm trying to remember. There's, there's yeah. Is it really that common? There's a chapter Oh, in, I did like, when I was like, a teenager, for sure. The, maybe, maybe in like my the late first, teens, early 20s. Like, like around like 30, 35% of the way into All Flames cast. There's, there's at least something very similar was there? to... Yeah, um, I might have even made a note of it when I read it. up in the mountain it. town, and um, oh. the come <laughs> yeah. out of the lake. <laughs> yeah, I think I actually included that in my notes when I uh, sent that over to you. I think I po highlighted that one now that I think on it. Anyway, uh, uh, firefight, <laughs> firefight. Um, where was he I? He does right like these one-liners at the end of his prologues. He does like yeah. his, I mean, he just likes his one-liners, period. We get, like, for Reminds example... Reminds me of Elantris. Yeah, like, the, the beginning of the book, and, you know, this is a manner in which it's a lot like Steelheart. We have these rapidly ending chapters these cliffhanger after cliffhanger after cliffhanger you know you start off with the hit on an epic and it just you, you know it, it drags you right in um, aside from of course how different the prologues are you know the book the actual narrative itself starts off in much the same fashion but we really didn't get our like our real what for me was the hook line until chapter three when he says my name is david charleston i killed yeah. people with superpowers you know cool line but uh, yep. we were already like 50 pages in at that point, I think. I'm just, yeah, you know, yeah, there was, there, there was quite a bit of action before we got, and I actually made note of that, that uh, uh, it took us quite a while before he named himself. Yeah. yeah and took... that, and which is interesting. It's kind of a bold choice, uh, and it was something I wanted to talk about, like, as far as the writer's perspective, where this is a first-person book, you know, and so uh, not naming your first-person main character until you know, the third chapter is like, it's like kind of a bold step to take. And, and what I think it is, is, it, you know, Brandon pulled it off because he has such a, a powerful sense of um, immediacy in his action, yeah. where by kicking it off with this action sequence, uh, fighting, uh, what was source field? Um, yeah, source uh, field, yeah. That as a reader, you're not really paying attention to the fact that you don't know the name, uh, and and you're you're pulled along by the action sequence, and and like taking a further step back, that's even 
Like, I don't think that would have worked in a first book of the series. Um, I mean, it's a sequel, so wouldn't you assume you, would, you, you would assume, know But then, his name? going by that logic, why would you also? Why would he also include all the other kind of useful exposition? Because he, I mean, he still has a lot of the explanation from the previous book. I noticed that, but Drew, I didn't notice. You're right. I didn't notice that he actually didn't name himself until that line too. That's uh, crazy. Yeah, I, mean, I just so, noticed that when you said that. You know, like, and and so my point about how he he pulls you along with this action sequence. It, it shouldn't work because if you don't have a named character and you don't have like like you don't have something to uh, latch onto to, to you know be drawn to to be invested in um, it's like it's easy for uh, an action sequence to fall flat where you're like I don't feel like there are any stakes here because I don't care about this character I don't know this character and uh, and yes Jared like it is a sequel but it's also like he clearly wrote it in such a manner that you could just start and read Firefight. You don't like, mm-hmm. you're like obviously it's much preferred you read the first book, but, <clears throat> but like you know th- this happens. People walk through the bookstore and and they see a title and they're like, oh that's cool, I'm gonna try this. And like maybe the bookstore's out of Steelheart, and so Firefight's the only one on the shelf. And they're like, oh I'll, I'll try this book, Brandon Sanderson, and and they read it and like, and so it, it's. It's still like a bold thing to do um, by not naming your first person character until chapter three, like and the it, end of chapter three. It is common, like I've seen in other series where they kind of give you a breakdown of the first book for anyone yeah. that's starting. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and, and, I mean, Harry Potter is famous. For I was this, just going to bring up Harry Potter. Thank you so much. <laughs> every book in the series, like there's a, a brief summary to like of order. like a reflection of what happened in the last book. Yeah. Yeah, J.K. So. Rowling is is uh, is pretty uh, notorious for that. I mean, I I I appreciated it, even though, you know, it was yeah. it, I've read those books again and again and again and again. Um, jeez, I actually might have read those books as much as I've read the Cosmere books still still at this point. Um, but you know, I appreciate it. It, it. I can absolutely see that that scenario that Drew that you just mentioned. Somebody walks into a bookstore, sees Firefight. Maybe Firefight's a new release, and they just have a whole bunch of it right there at the front. It's got some excellent cover art. It's really eye you know yeah. eye catching. Yeah. Uh, I could see like a fifteen year old, seventeen year old picking up that book, going, "Oh, what's the, oh this sounds kind of cool," you know. Um, but I mean, mm-hmm. since we're talking about our uh, David already, you want to just dive into our character discussion section of the uh, sure. the podcast yeah, yeah. And, and kick off with David here because you know the main character obviously it it makes a lot of sense he gets way more uh character development in this novel way way more mm-hmm. um and i'm going to start off with a quote something i noticed right at, right away at the, at the beginning during the source field hit and there's a moment over the reckoners uh i was going to say their voice chat i've played way too many video games lately oh my god over their um uh mobiles. Their, yeah, they're, yeah they're, they're mobiles thank you they're mobiles and <laughs> and prof says David thinks he can do this. I trust him. And then David just smiles. And he has an introspective moment where he realizes just how lonely his life has been until he actually joined the Reckoners. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, man? I, I agree. Uh, and he had another note. Um, I don't know if it was in in that same chapter. It was, it was fairly early in the book, though. Another point where he talked about how, like... Oh, it was when he was meeting the mayor um, oh. after killing Sorcerer. Yeah. And he's like, um, I feel like this is the social expectation of me, but I don't really know. And he's like, not that I was like an awkward, like socially inept person, but growing up, but I spent all my time researching the epics and like throwing myself into this revenge project instead of spending my time making friends and being in social situations. And so he doesn't really know or understand a lot of social cues. uh, and, And he's learning. And because you see, now he's like in in you know a more public sphere, and he's interacting with people more often. And you see later on how awkward it makes him feel when people are calling him Steel Slayer. Oh yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And he, I mean, he specifically mentions um, how he didn't. Oh, sh- this actually might have been during mitosis when he mentioned that he didn't do this for fame. He was not ready for yeah, fame. That's not that why he does this. Uh, you know, and how how uncomfortable it makes him because he's he's grown up his whole life learning to hide, to make himself yeah. unnoticed, to make himself kind of blend in. And with this level of notoriety that he's found himself with, he's just, or this, this outright fame, this uh, almost devotion from the people of Nukago, he's just, he doesn't know what to do with it. And I think it was really important for Brandon to take him out of that setting 
Um, yeah. Because yeah, I, I just I couldn't see that, you know, I, I could only see that going in worse places for him and making him more frustrated and making him more antisocial. But but mm-hmm. plucking him out of that setting and bringing him to a, a, a totally new setting like Babylar, for example, um, and meeting all the individuals there, I think was really, really a really good source of, uh, you know, just character development, uh, things that Brandon can do to to really continue to humanize David. I mean, I didn't yeah. really sympathize with him too much, or empathize with him, I should say, too much during Steelheart. Yeah, I agree. And so uh, I I want to talk about kind of what sort of character development mm. there was with David in Steelheart versus in Firefight. Because in Steelheart, it was him coming of age. It was this classic YA kind of Bildungsroman, you know, uh, innocent uh, teenager who, who needs to, like, grow up and find out who he is and, and all of this, and... And learn some life lessons. Whereas Firefight, he is essentially an adult from the get-go. And now he's learning to navigate an adult world. He's no longer naive. He's no longer, you know, a, a, you know, just another teenager. He's he's a public figure now. He's uh he's throwing himself into romantic relationships. He's navigating like uh the the social, um, uh, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the social demands of young adulthood that he didn't have to bother with in Steelheart. Steelheart was all about the job. And then here he's, he's learning how to be an adult instead of just growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his whole, his goal isn't all revenge based now. Mm -hmm. And he's learning that, going after epics isn't as simple as revenge anymore. Yeah, he has a whole lot of... Especially given his love interest, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that provides a whole that provides a whole new dimension to, to, or to... I should say maybe just, you know, weight to the, the, the moral struggle he finds himself with now that he's accomplished his goal. You know, he's, he's taken down the epic that has killed his father. He's taken down the epic that rules his city like, you know, uh, well... Like he did, um, but finding himself in in Babylar, he's like Drew mentioned. He's got to kind of figure out this this whole new scenery, and not just with literal scenery, but the you know being an adult, being at this stage in his life where he's supposed to be making new connections and still kind of being awkward and weird about it. And I do want to mm-hmm. bring one scene to the the forefront here, and that was his scene at the party with yes. uh, when he went with Mizzy. And I'd actually originally uh, saved this point when we got to our discussion about Mizzy. But I I can just insert it here now because it still pertains a lot to David, of course, and that is how good it is to know that Brandon has absolutely been that awkward dude at the party who doesn't (laughs) know anybody uh, and doesn't really know. He's kind of uncertain as to what to do with himself. I mean, I found that scene very... It hit pretty hard, um, and I I definitely appreciated it for it. It uh, it gave David so much more... Trying to figure out how to dance. Yeah. yeah, more than anything else we got in Steelheart for me at least. Um, and and that that ties back to like where I was ultimately going, and, and that is uh, the theme for David's character development in this book is overcoming his fears, mm. and it's overcoming his his um, hesitations, and and it's his you know it was his reluctance you know uh, at the beginning you know to be a public figure. It was his it was his desire to just to remain david charleston and not have to deal with being steel slayer and as you move through and and you go into uh, babylar and now he's overcoming his social fears and then at the end of the book we see him overcome his like phobia with the the scene with calamity where he he rejects um he rejects the gift of the power yeah and and overcomes his his terror of drowning you know (laughs) yeah and, uh, and and so it's a through line that changes from the beginning through the middle and to the end of him a- approaching and dealing with different kinds of fears in his life. Yeah. You know, I'm really glad you brought up that scene in particular because that's exactly where my next point had to do with David's character. And, and there's that uh, there's a moment in which, um, and I'm going to back up real quickly here just for one second, but there's a moment when David lobs his last kind of red balloon at Sourcefield. Let's just begin with that moment. And she turns and she has this rather 
cool moment of rising to glory, as we've seen high epics do before. And then David specifically has this moment where he thinks, was there any wonder these, these things presume to rule? And in that moment, I'm starting to think, oh, I mean, that's a real flattering manner in which he's describing these epics. But then he spits at her feet in that same moment. So, I, I mean, I don't want to be confused with saying that he's, he's you know, really particularly, uh, I guess, envious of the epics. Um, but I, I definitely get the sense that he, I, I, I want to say he definitely loathes the epics, but... Well, he's previously. starting to realize it's not black and white. Yeah, previously I had I had thought that this is the kind only the kind of loathing that that is born from envy, you know. Um, but of course, again, he immediately spits at her feet, and I'm going, "Oh, okay, uh, nah, <laughs> that was that was that was pretty uh, that was pretty succinct." Um, yeah. But uh, shit, why was I? I'm not sure why that one I mean, was in there. Let's was let's talking continue. About, like, the topic of fear. Yeah, you were um, talking about and... about David facing his fears. Uh, I mean, what did? Oh, oh no, because the moment with calamity where he rejects the offer of the powers. Yeah, yeah. Was that where you were going? Yeah, with? there. That was exactly where I was going, but I can't remember. I, I've lost in my notes here. I have two separate sources of notes here, and I'm I've lost exactly which one. I'll I'll come back to that eventually. I had a good point <laughs> well, there. But I mean, let's continue. If if I'm if I can like kind of make an attempt to bridge sure. what I think you were going for there, because you're talking about uh, this moment of you know almost like worshipful um uh envy. you know envy, yeah. maybe not envy but, but like it, it could have been envy um and then he spits instead of and it's like that's like obviously a very disrespectful thing to do and and it, it's an indicator that maybe he's not just like it's purely yeah, envious kinda... and then and then that final you know that that uh, climactic scene when when calamity comes down and offers him epic powers and and he rejects it and uh and he deals with his fear and that that is like the culmination of this um two book long arc where he he feels um uh bereft of agency and power and and it's like it's, he's trying to like find that and that's why like he's so excited to join the recorders because finally for the first time in his life he has an opportunity to really do something to take yeah. action and even then, they're at such a disadvantage against the epics, and he's seeing all these crazy different powers in front of him, and it would be very easy for him to say, man, I wish I had that. It would. I be wish easy. I wasn't just a normal guy. Yeah. And then at the <laughs> end of Firefight, he's given that chance to have that, and he says no. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I had been waiting for, I guess, from, from the beginning. I'm sure a lot of people were waiting for it. It's like... Well, is David ever himself going to become an epic? I mean, we had that, that answer I mean, to, the, to that question... Um, not is David going to be, but is it possible for more epics to be born after mm -hmm. the rise of Calamity, or, or did they all just arrive with Calamity and that's it? There's only mm -hmm. a certain amount. You know, we got that answer. I think it was in this in this book. And it, it was, was like yeah. you know, the, sometimes they continue to develop, and you, this whole time you're wondering, well, David's our main character. He needs something. Like, I suppose he's got those in his life around him who can fight epics, who are epics, but you know. I, it, it would be hard for me to be in David's position and not crave these superpowers and think to your, think to myself, I can resist the darkness. I will I will be different. Um, but you know, as we learn from the nature of these things, go of uh, this. Oh wait, wait, no, that's in the next book. Nope, I stopped myself yeah, just in yeah, time yeah. there. <laughs> Boom. Um, so yeah, but, but let's so slide that, on that past that with with David rejecting the power and overcoming his fear, like. One of the things Brandon did uh, that was so impressive with his characters in this is that he instills like a real sense of pride um, in the reader. Like, like I find myself being proud of David and proud of Megan as if they were real people that I know and I'm friends with, and I'm seeing them struggle. And it's just you know, like there's some there are plenty of books out there where people characters overcome you know obstacles and conflicts, and I don't feel pride for them. I'm not proud of them. I'm like, oh yeah, of course, like you know that's that's what you did there. But there were things in this book, there was a, a level of intimacy and a level of um, sympathy that I had with both Megan and David in certain ways. And, and so in the ultimate conclusion of this book, when they approached and overcame those things, I felt proud of them. Yeah. You know, like this, and I can see that. I can see. You that. know, this is why I love this book so much because it it really hits on an emotional level that not many other Brandon Sanderson books do. For yeah. me personally, um, and like like Megan, 
you know, I, this is why you know, I said I, I love, you know, that conversation in the hallway um, when when she like shows up after the party, when when David uh. and Obliteration are doing. Yeah. And then Megan shows up. Right. And they have this conversation. I love and how she opens this... that conversation, too. She's like, why is it every time I find you, you're staring at another woman's backside or something like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and there was so much packed into those, like, whatever, three, four pages. It was such a fraught moment between the two of them. So much was riding on how that conversation went. And it's a volatile situation for David because Megan is an epic and she's been using her powers. And so she's like, and for her, she's warring within herself with the inherent evil that comes with uh, using her powers and her respect and admiration and and interest in David at the same time. And so it's this like, like real, you know, like walking on eggshells situation, but it ultimately, you know, it, it resolves in this moment where David goes in to kiss her and she she you know leans into it and then stops and puts a gun to his head yeah <laughs> and and then david <laughs> notes that that last time when she drew you know pulled the gun on him she flicked the safety on and he's like if that wasn't love i don't know what is <laughs> which is such a twisted morbid way to Great look at line. it but knowing Great david's line. character that's indicative of what their relationship is that gun is a metaphor for megan's uh, you know, regard for David. It's it's a loaded gun that could go yeah. off any time. But Megan made a choice there to say, no, I'm not giving in to my evil. I'm yeah. turning on that safety. Yeah. And and that's like that's a moment when I felt proud of her for for overcoming this Same. internal, you know, uh struggle and you know, like, I mean, that that's the scene I was saying. Like, that's one of the most brilliant scenes Brandon has ever <clears throat> written. It was flawlessly done. It was some of the best character uh, interaction, best dialogue, best um, uh, internal, like, narrative it, from David's side of things. Like, it was just beautiful. I, that's, that's, like, probably my single favorite moment in this entire trilogy. Wow. That's, uh, I mean, I was, I was right on there with you then until that until that last day <laughs> uh but no i agree with pretty much every everything that you just said i mean we got so much more between david and megan their relationship and we got so much more humanization of the epics in general but especially megan in this one because in the first one i'll admit i didn't I wasn't really too much on the Megan train. I wasn't a huge fan in Steelheart because she was just giving off so many mixed signals. And, of course, we found out why that was. But it still, you know, it just it didn't really, I don't know, it didn't really change my mind when I was when I was reading this this trilogy through for the first time. Maybe even the second or third time. But um, now, now that I've done a much more in-depth analysis, you know, taking notes as I go along for the podcast, as I have been, you know, I can absolutely see what you're saying, Drew, and I can appreciate it a lot more for that. Um, like, okay, so there's there was this there was this great scene that we had with between David and Megan, and that was when David was hiding Megan in his bedroom. You know, that yeah. was that was a great laugh. The situational <laughs> yeah. comedy in this one it just continues to shine. Um, it was mm -hmm. it was an absolute winner of a scene, but I, I really appreciated um, the the look we got. At Megan's, I don't want to say her. Well, I should say I should say her lack of of uh, I don't want to say agency, but just the, the way that she she, despite being one of the most powerful high epics that we've ever seen, or that maybe has ever been, she still finds herself powerless in a lot of cases. I mean, it was funny to read. You know, there was a moment when she's under the bed and she goes, she groans. She's just like, I feel like a teenager, you know. And I mean, it got a chuckle out of me, but it also does something that I hadn't considered before. Um, you know, she has the choice in this scene between hiding under the bed and the danger of being caught by the Reckoners, or using her illusional dimensions, or her illusions slash dimensional rips to hide, which would kind of, cor you know, corrupt her personality more. Mm -hmm. And it's that choice, I think, that, that shitty choice that she has there that gives her so much room, to me, to grow as a character in this one. Yes, very definitely. Um, it, it's... You know, it's a, a a mark in her favor in terms of uh, her 
like her strength of character you know that that she and as much as she denies it all the time like like there there's like a couple of points where she tells david like like what if i don't want to be good what yeah. if i don't like people what if i i think in the hallway scene she says like what if i never liked people even before calamity hmm. you know and like she she wants to give herself these outs these easy excuses but but when push comes to shove, she doesn't do it. She doesn't take the easy road. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of reflected in how she eventually denies Regalia mm -hmm. in the end. You know, she originally sought out Regalia in order because she thought Regalia could remove her powers or somehow make it easier on her. Mm -hmm. And in the end, she chose not oh, to yeah, do that. And instead, that. Yeah. and instead runs into a burning building. And overcomes her fear. To save David. I totally forgot yep. about that. In that moment, I'm just remembering now, in that moment I had made a, uh, a note to myself to, to write that down, but the supervisor was walking by. I couldn't pull up my phone at that point. But you're right. That was a very, very definitive moment for her character when we actually learned the reason she went to Babylon in the first place. Because she, you know, she considers her powers as yep. something, you know... Uh, well, first off, as a curse, clearly, but as something that, that is outside of her, that's something that she wants removed that's not part of her. Which I mm -hmm. think, you know, is a very, very, very important thing for her to realize. Um, and also, I think, is, is, is the key to why she was able to overcome those fears of hers, you know, fire, her and weakness. And I, I think it's, I think it's awesome how in the, by the end of the book, the relationship between David and Megan is one of them embracing their powers and one of them rejecting them both for very oh. good reasons i hadn't considered that that's a neat little bit of duality there wasn't it yeah 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 so uh who else we should be you guys uh have anything more specifically about megan you want to discuss because for me i just wrote down the one but i know drew is a huge megan fan and i want to give him the opportunity to uh <laughs> um discuss I... her like i just have such a big crush on her like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, if I, Drew, if Drew oh, had a crush on her in Steelheart, I can only imagine what it's like after. That's actually after. one more point that I wanted to bring up about about Megan. It, it, that that was uh, something I find really kind of unconventional, but it, you know, it works in this case, and that's the fact that Megan is a year older than David, and something yes. that was a you yeah. know a bit of a source of comedy here and there for their characters as well, at least for us between the two of them. Um, wait, didn't she point it out at, at one point and he's like wait a second you're only a year older than me yeah you know i mean that, right? my first girlfriend when i was 16 was a year older than i was and that was actually really awkward because hmm. that was right at the age when 16 and 17 at least here in ontario i don't know where how it is down there but that's the difference between being able to drive a car and being able to own a car and drive yourself right oh. so she was actually picking me up for a lot of our dates a lot of the time I mean, she had the car mm -hmm. but you know as a you don't typically see at least from my experience, from my um, bit of experience there in in this genre, that you don't typically see the 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 girl in the relationship being the older one and more um, mature one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more mature one. Clearly, the more mature. Well, I guess even a lot of knowing teenage boys, you know, even though the girl can be a year or two younger, she's still typically more mature. <laughs> um, at least from going by the dudes that I know. Um, but. Yeah, I, I, I appreciated the fact that she was a year older than David, and I don't really see that very often in these sorts of books, especially with young adults and young adult books, you know. Um, yeah, that's why I just wanted uh, to make a quick so point of I, that. I'm willing to forego further Megan um, discussion until Calamity, Calamity. Sure. except I have one final thing. Yeah. And that is the, like, the epilogue scene. The what scene, sorry? I, that you cut the out epilogue. there for a second? Sorry, I talked over you that time. I'm going to shut up. Say it again. The epilogue. Oh, yeah, the epilogue. Um, where, you know, there's there's kind of this combo, like, tender moment with, like, Megan in, like, recovery with David. And then also this big setup for, like, big stakes for the next book because Prof is evil now and, and he's given <clears throat> in and all this. But there's one moment in it, and this is, again, just part of why I love Megan so much. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, she's talking about, like, well, they're, they're discussing, like, overcoming the, the evilness, and, and, and David says it has to be the fear and all that. And, uh, and he says the theory makes sense. It's like oatmeal on pancakes. 
And then she says, you know, you're not actually bad at metaphors. Yeah. And he says, thanks. And she gets, says, because most of the things you say are similes. Those are what yeah. you're really bad at. And she and, waited this long to tell him that. Yeah, and and I, I I love that because that was, I mean, again, that's Brandon Sanderson, like, speaking directly to all of those fans who are like, oh, it's not it's not a metaphor, it's a simile. And, like, yeah. and, uh, and, and him saying, yes, I recognize that. Even though, like, technically speaking, similes are a kind of metaphor, so it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, a square versus a rectangle thing. Um, well, I think I that technicality that is exactly had... what makes the joke work. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I and I love that he had Megan be the one to call it out, though. Yeah. To 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 be that voice for all those fans who are bugged by that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, that was a cool moment. Yeah. That's. I'll 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 leave off on Megan with that. Sure. So Should we, uh, we just, talk about Prof now? I was just going to bring up Prof. Thank you so much, Jared. I was going to say, you just mentioned Prof. That's a perfect point to, uh, start, you know, do to start off with. Doesn't, um, he kind of, uh, doesn't he kind of go the opposite direction of Megan, I guess? Yeah. <clears throat> no, I was uh, just well, although, not, not although, I will entirely. say it's for ex- somewhat altruistic reasons. That yes. He oh, very altruistic reasons, but still, <clears throat> like... He makes a sacrifice. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he seems but to represent it's a very different kind of sacrifice. You know, the whole moral aspect of the epics that we've been given. You know, through his interactions with David, we see, we continue to see how alike they are, despite their respective attitudes toward the epics. You know, and how it continues to add tension. You know, it, it it's tearing those two further and further apart. Um, and on that subject, you know, the ending and where he ended up. You know, my first time through Firefight, I will admit, I was a little disappointed by the ending. Not in terms of quality; it was phenomenal. Just in, just in what happened in, in the plot, because I knew how much it was going to hurt Prof when he finally understands what he's done. Yeah. You know, making him the ultimate endgame for Regalia, who we, ha- we ha- have really haven't even mentioned up until now, actually, we did once. Um, but she's such a huge pivotal part of this book. She's just, mm-hmm. I guess the whole book kind of happens around Regalia. We'll, we'll get there eventually. Um, but the, the ultimate endgame for Regalia, you know, being prof and corrupting prof and having a successor you know i think it was the it was the perfect way to set up the final installment calamity um, oh yeah now that i know what to look for um or maybe it's just because you know i was doing such an in-depth observation for the podcast but i'm seeing it more and more as the only solution that to that kind of moral question that was constantly tearing david and prof apart despite how clearly alike they are you know Mm mm-hmm um, you know, that question, of course, being, are the epics redeemable? Are they at fault? You know, truly at fault for what they do, and even if they are truly at fault for what they do, does that kind of excuse the whole socioeconomic and outright chaos that results in dethroning them? Mm-hmm. So, and then, and then thrown into the, the moral situation as sort of a foil for Prof is obliteration in this book. Oh, I, I definitely want to talk about obliteration. Oh, he was so cool. In, in a lot of ways, he, he is Prof's, like the, the other side of Prof's coin. It's like his, his antithesis, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, he, where he throws himself into the destruction and the evil and he loves it and like... Mm. And, and you know, he's, he's not only an epic and, and corrupted, but also like... Like you, you get the impression that he's like, kind of insane. Like that yeah. he's like a psychopath on top of having this corruption from the powers. Obliteration, you mean? Yeah, uh, obliteration. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, and so, so he he's eager to embrace the corruption and to well, embrace the evil, where Prof is reluctant. I would argue and... otherwise, though, because because obliteration doesn't see it as evil. He actually sees it as the opposite. He well, sees himself well, as an angel. That's my point. He he throws himself into it. He's oh, eager okay. to it, and that's and that's where the, like I'm talking about. He comes across as a psychopath because he he got gotcha. you okay. Know, like, uh, and and so Prof, whereas like, you know, Prof sees himself as like like a time bomb essentially, like as as a something dangerous, and that he's hmm. reluctant to use his powers and and all of this because he knows he has the knowledge of what could happen. But it's a great, isn't it? A great mark of his character that in the end he does it anyway for what he thinks is the greater yes. good. Yes. Yeah. And I would, I mean, he doesn't depends do it for on selfish reason. Right. Yeah. yeah he, he definitely never, never really does anything for selfish reasons. He just, he has such a a, a lack of faith in himself, but you know, justified or not. Um, you know, mm-hmm. there's a. I I will say I don't like profs 
attitude towards epics. And at this point, you know, the reader can be falling on either side of that fence. Do they think the epics are evil and they need to all be killed? Are some of them redeemable? Are they all redeemable? Um, is it worth the kind of, you know, moral dilemma of, of and just cultural dilemma of, of killing them in, in the chaos that ensues? Um, the revelation of Prof's plan to bait Firefight with David all along. I mean... <laughs> Technically, he betrayed David long before David actually betrayed him, yes. right? Yeah. yeah, it was so. I mean, it was excellently written, but so god, it was cold, damn, it was cold. heartbreaking to read, man. That was, I mean, uh, right up there with the end of you know Shadows of Self. I'm not going to spoil that, obviously, but I, th I would say <laughs> oh, that I this is like that, yeah. damn near that that level of just damn Sanderson. That's cold. Um, Why? I I, I do think it's also like a cool um a cool note that uh like David gets this relationship with Prof in this book. He doesn't yes. really have a relationship with him in Steelheart. He Prof idolizes is Prof. Yeah, yeah, he's he's almost like dehumanized in Steelheart where he's he's like so above, so competent in control all that. And then in in Firefight we see him vulnerable for the first time. We see him personable and we see him having a a a professional and personal relationship with david you say personable which, personable yeah i didn't find him personable at all in this one well but but like not not in like an amiable way but like we see him connecting on a personal level uh, yeah oh well, yeah the... he's like he's more human yeah he's more human in this um because because he he felt uh, a little flat to me in Steelheart. Sure. Whereas he gets depth, he's more of a like round, dynamic character in Firefight. And part of that in this one is because he has a very personal relationship with the main antagonist in yes. Galia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and that's a lot of what drives his feelings towards Epics is that he was once on some sort of team with her mm -hmm. that went terribly wrong. Yeah. Yep. A lot of uh, intrigue there. I was like, ooh, I, oh, I want to know more about what's going on in the background there. I always okay. thought that, that Prof was perhaps some part of the team that just created the epics, and that's how he's so yeah. good at killing them. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, seeing... Uh, it, it was really, really great also, by the way. This is something that I just remembered. The scene between David and Prof when David finds the picture of Prof's time at NASA. Yeah, the, oh, yeah. The, yeah. And we get a little more on, on Tia's background there too, and, and mm -hmm. their relationship. And I found that really, really gave Prof this 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 kind of gravitas, you know, this this whole like new dimension of like this new window through which to view that character. It was a startling moment of humanity, um, yeah. not just between David and Prof, but just about Prof himself. And I also like the fact that we are getting a you know in this book we are getting a few little hints as to his weakness i'm not gonna say more uh yeah. but they're definitely there and they're definitely yeah. not obvious i mean sanderson is mm -hmm. not usually one to make that kind of thing obvious i'm not saying he is <laughs> but um i'll i'll go a step farther and say i wasn't even sure i was remembering his weakness correctly mm -hmm. until we got some very subtle hints and then i was certain uh -huh. i was like oh yeah i okay, did not I remember in steelheart i was reminded reading this yeah um, yeah, I like how he so, sowed those seeds so in there. To your point about like how he he in this book um, lends like gravity to Prof's character, right? Yeah, it's it's one of the more impressive things from a writing standpoint that he did in in Firefly, among many impressive things. Uh, if I you know in case I haven't gushed over this book enough, um, because <laughs> the the central you know the focus of this book is the relationship between David and Megan, and it's and it's their individual and connected development as characters but in in like a really unobtrusive way he he spends almost more effort building prof up so that when we get that turn at the end prof as a you know as a, an antagonist in calamity going into the third book is so much more powerful so much more dangerous and threatening <laughs> Like if you think about yeah, if, he is. if you if you had had Prof use his powers at the end of Steelheart and turn evil, then it wouldn't have been mm. that like 
Like, yeah, it would have sucked, but it wouldn't have had that, like, powerful sense of betrayal and fear in the reader. Like, holy crap, like, he is so dangerous. He is mm. so unstoppable. And now he's a bad guy. Whereas at the end of Steelheart, it was like, oh, he's, he's like, another high epic. Yeah. Because you and, didn't know him. Yeah, and I and really so appreciate despite the Sorry, go ahead. Despite the focus on David and Megan in Firefight, he, Brandon managed to build up all of this foundation under Prof to set up the next book. And he, I would say he, he demonstrated that right away. Because after Prof has his whole epic moment of awesome when he's directing that nuclear bomb into this into the sky that would be yeah. such a cool by the way that'd be how cool a, a, mo, a movie poster would that yeah, be just prop yeah, yeah. just reaching up and and the mushroom cloud above him anyway um uh shit, where was i going with that i got really excited about that all of a sudden <laughs> i don't know <laughs> where, what were we just talking about right before that oh uh, like how brandon built up oh, prof yeah and and as that happened you're still kind of wondering okay how is prof doing he he's kind of he's left there he's done the deed he's breathing heavily there's that, that, that really, really tense moment of you still don't know what's going to happen, what's happening yes. next. Is he still prof? Is he not prof? And then Brandon manages to answer that question immediately by placing Val and XL in his proximity. Because yeah. that was brutal. <sighs> I mean, that was, yes. oh, boy. I mean, there, there are a lot mm -hmm. of terrible things that epics do to people in these books and that's a notable that's okay. example of those. not that you're ever super attached to either of them but the way they went was pretty brutal yeah no i mean oh, i loved excel he was freaking cool i mean he was yeah, a little I, creepy I liked but excel a lot he was, i found him really really enjoyable to read val not so much i, yeah, found I hated val <laughs> very very hard to like val and i you know this is despite the fact that i somehow totally forgot that she tried to kill david after wounding mm -hmm. him in the leg i remembered her shooting him in the leg i didn't remember her hasty assumptions as to his true allegiances and just without checking in first deciding i'm gonna plant one in his forehead you know yeah and then to be Prof fair to save she's the day. she's kind of in the same spot that david was in in steelheart but to an extent i don't i don't know but david wasn't i mean if david found a traitor in their midst i mean he he specifically says he's not willing to shoot or kill enforcement oh he is willing to shoot enforcement officers but like i mean it was just so so cold and personal the way Val had him down there and she was just like well yeah. you betrayed us you're wounded you, you can't fight back I'm gonna plug you right now it's just like I don't know I couldn't see David ever stooping quite down to that level no matter how emotionally traumatized no. he is over the loss of his loved one because again I mean that's one thing that they have in common you know even when David captures an epic he is yeah intending to capture and not kill with yeah. Knox, right? Yeah, with Knox. Yeah. yeah. Um, so speaking of the, the New York Reckoners, um how do we feel about Mizzy? Ah ha. Okay, let's get into this. Um <laughs> I didn't I didn't I it's just I didn't like Mizzy at all. Neither did I. Hey. Um, I and she's hey. like a fan favorite and I don't understand it. Oh, she she's a fan favorite. Of course, she's a fan yeah. favorite. I didn't know that, but you know what? I'm not surprised at all. I like her more than Cody, for example. Yeah, yeah, a guess. little. Well, I mean, no, Cody's no, a, actually, no. Cody's obnoxious. No, I actually, now that I seriously compare the two, I actually like Cody. Well, not I don't want to say really? I like Cody more. Ooh. I hate Mizzy more. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not. Okay. With Mizzy. Okay. Um, so, uh -oh. so the Reckoners is is completed, right? Oh no. Um, uh, we have we have the trilogy, and then Brandon's going to be writing like a sort of like not sequel but same universe uh the apocalypse guard oh no and he's co-writing it with uh i think like <laughs> howard oh crap i don't know uh, dan wells or, or uh but anyway um uh yeah one of the uh, writing has excuses. spoken about writing an actual reckoners outrigger sequel with mizzy as the main oh character. no <laughs> that's the sound of me dying inside a little bit <laughs> Um, yeah, yep. okay, uh, yep. I'm gonna have to absorb that one for a minute. I mean, yep. I'm, I'm probably just simply not going to read it, which uh, I'm sure neither of them I'm would not. be offended to hear. It's not like they need my, you know, uh, uh, shit, what's the word? Uh, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> they, uh, approval, I mean, like, thank like, you. I'll, I'll legitimately say, like, right now, if, if he does write that book, and, like, 
Peter asks me if I want to bait it, I'm gonna be like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, how can you turn that down though? Uh, oh, you'd have to do it. Come you'd on. have to do it. I do not want to read 400 pages of Mizzy. I'm sorry. It would, but maybe but, that's exactly why they need. Yeah. You. I mean, they need they need people who like Mizzy. I'm I'm assuming that Brandon will want somebody that doesn't like Mizzy, so he can get, you know, both sides. I mean, that's why I'm so kind of, I don't know, uh, fearless with my condemnation of. Uh, uh, was it Ironsides and Cobb during the Skyward episode? I've listened yeah, to that yeah. one a couple times now, and I'm in the middle of welding. I'm going, ooh, maybe I was a little, maybe I was a little too scathing on those ones. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm sure that they need a, a, a wide, you know, oh, no, yeah, he variety does, he does. Of, of of opinions and angles. I mean, dude, like, trust it. me, if you if you could see like what what the beta comments look like, like there are severe arguments that go down <laughs> among bet. the beta readers. I bet. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know. She's thing. just she's just totally meh. I don't have much to say about her, and to me, that's an indictment on her. I unfortunately do. Um, well, go for it. Not a lot. I mean, she's not on the same level. But uh, honestly, I have more to say about Mizzy than I had about Megan. That's kind of give you an idea as to how much I didn't like. <laughs> wow. <her>. Wow. Um. <clears throat> so, first off, and this is not at all why I don't like her. I just this is just a, a question I want to start this off with. Why the hell does Mizzy use sparks as a curse? I mean, she's not from New Cargo, she, City of Steel. And then for yeah. that reason, why does... Then I, that got me thinking, why does David use it, for that matter? Or anyone from New Cargo? The city's only a few years old. So I guess we presume that that was a curse word already, before the city got turned to steel? I don't know. But you did mention last know. episode, Drew, that is, yeah. Sparks just... <laughs> was not really landing for you, right? Mm-mm. This is one of the reasons why I don't like it. And I'm starting to see why now. Sense. I think once I started to consider that or maybe it's not why you don't like it but it started why it's kind of you know it's starting to bother me a little bit but you know uh that's beside the point mizzy she is clearly the new comedic relief I mean, that that is something that you said about i think it was about cody during steelheart she's there for one reason and that reason is very obvious yeah um yeah for me she might as well I, I went down to write down she might as well be wearing a neon sign and just holding it up that says, Hey, everybody, I'm funny! With an arrow pointing down <laughs> yeah. to her no, seriously. stupid, stupid self. Seriously. Um, I mean, writing all the little hearts and unnecessary comments on the dry erase board during oh, her, that's so what annoying. was her very first Reckoner oh, oh. planning session with Jonathan Fedris himself. I mean, she wrote more goddamn jokes on the thing than actual information. By the I end, it was put up with her. It was it was pretty much a board filled up with, Hey, everybody, I, just a reminder that I'm really quirky. With the Reckoner's yeah. hit on Regalia is as the graffiti itself. You know, it's just, I was just so yeah. exasperated with, with Mizzy. And, um... Yeah. I, you know, I'll just... It was, it was like, she, she was... I'm not gonna say she was, like, the trope, um, like, capital T trope Manic Pixie Dream Girl, but she has, like, elements of that. It, like, her whole character just screams, look at how quirky I am. Hmm. Look yeah. at how fun and different I am. Yeah. And, and it's she, like, and it yeah. comes off to me as like, not, not necessarily she herself is trying too hard, but Brandon was trying too hard. Like, yeah. Uh, Mizzy's yeah. one of my very few criticisms of this book. And it's like one of the things that maybe keeps Firefight from creeping its way into that absolute top tier with Words of Radiance and Oathbringer. Hmm. So... I can see that, and you know, but you know, and it's like we've. I mean, how many times have we talked about this? Like, Brandon, just like his sense of humor, is not <laughs> it's forced. Is yeah, is not like the lightest touch. <laughs> <laughs> he's not. So. He's very subtle about his foreshadowing. He's less subtle <laughs> in other areas. He's, he's a friggin' sledgehammer yeah. with his with his comedic. He's a relief. sledgehammer with a stick of dynamite strapped to it. Is what he yeah. is. Yeah. You know, contrast. <laughs> the only, I, the, uh, sorry, I was going to tangent. I was just saying yeah, the only it, time I liked Brandon, I've liked Brandon humor uh, was Miss Born Era 2. You like Wayne? Mm-hmm. Oh, we're, we're going to get to that. Uh, <laughs> when we get to, when we get to that, we'll get to that. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I really wish I didn't anyway, hear that one. Okay. But, but, so Rob, do you have anything more on Mizzy? You know, contrary, contrary to everything that she says, I she did do something that I found very interesting, and that was what I mentioned earlier. She she gave us that, you know, proverbial window into David's character by bringing him to the party and introducing him to her friends. Um, and that's 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 really the only, only thing yeah. I have to say about Mizzy that is not completely scathing and 
I'm trying my very best not to insert expletives. I just, yeah. I, uh, I don't okay. know. I, 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 I just, uh, hold, are you kidding me? An uh, actual novella with Mizzy? No, a novel. No, not a novel. Don't be serious <laughs> about that. Are you, I, I heard novella, an actual novel? Yeah. Oh, ah, ah, it just, uh, um, but anyway, anyway, let's... anyway, like I, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're closing in on an hour here. Um, do we want to like, you know, get some like last sure. impressions, thoughts I, before we I, move into the final I don't want to end on a negative note. So I'm, I want to talk about a couple of these metaphors that I love so much. What actually, oh. I want to ask you, Drew, okay. did you find them more palatable in this one or less so, or <laughs> um, approximately the same? Yeah, about the same. Really? I, you know, like, like I, <sighs> I, I found there were more. He was he was less subtle about them, but I think they were even funnier. I mean, if, for anyone who remembers last episode, I said I actually really really liked the metaphors, and I can't figure out why. Um, that's the kind of quirk to Sanderson's writing that I often kind of don't enjoy, but just for some reason, and I can't explain it, I love these metaphors. I don't think you're alone. I love them. I, I, I mean, I don't know. It's just the manner in which he, he, he gets so close to what he's trying to say. So it's just, I think he, Brandon finds that really, really good balance, that comedic balance, where it's easy to say something that's completely nonsensical, and it's also easy to dive into an actual, you know, an idiom or an actual uh, simile. But to make one that almost works, I think, is a kind of art form in itself. Um, there was, at the very beginning, David says, I mix with ordinary people about as well as a bucket of paint mixed with a bag of gerbils. I love that one. I was just like, ha, huh, that was a good one. Um, but yeah. the one that so, got... Sorry, go ahead. All right, all right. No, you finish, you finish. The one that got the outright laughter out of me, the one I was laughing at to the point of near tears, was when we got quiet as a buttered snail sneaking through a Frenchman's kitchen. I did like yeah, that, that one. That was pretty good. That was awesome. That, that was clever. Was, uh, that like, was clever. Ah, it was, it was great. Um... Yeah, what, what were you about to say there, Drew, before I continue? So, I'm going to go back to that hallway scene uh -huh. with Megan and David. Um, and, and like, this, so this metaphor he uses here is emblematic of my relationship with, like, metaphors in the series as a whole. Hmm. And it's the, the one that lots and lots of people like to bring up. It's the potato in a minefield. <laughs> potato in a minefield, yeah. And... I, I hate this metaphor. What? I hate this. <laughs> what? This is so dumb. It's so bad. But the sentiment behind it, and when David, in his panic, tries desperately to explain, and Megan's response to it is perfect. <laughs> I, I love, she's just, that's the best you can do, seriously. And then he goes through this whole thing, and she just goes, a potato. And he's like, sure. French fries, mashed potatoes? Yeah. Who doesn't like potatoes? And she's like, funny <laughs> people. Why can't I be something sweet? Like, you know, and it's... Yeah, why can't I be the, something sweet like the, a cupcake? The metaphor itself It's Because like, a cupcake wouldn't go to my field. <laughs> I know, I loved it. I don't know. Uh, uh. But, but the scene around it is so good. Mm. Well, So, like... <laughs> <laughs> so you give it a pass? No, I'm not even giving the metaphor a pass. That's a hard fail. But the whole no. rest of the scene is so f***ing brilliant. Wow, I just I just cursed. Wow. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I, I don't it's... curse like on these things. Rob's the one who needs to get only censored. during the uh, acts of Cain is when when you when you curse. Which when I hear it, I'm just like, whoa, he doesn't really even curse in the voice chat. Well, you know? and that's and that's why now I'm like, well, the like voice you chat can tell too. how how. <laughs> How much I care about this, this scene. Is personal. What this scene does for me. I just dropped an F-bomb talking about it. <laughs> but that's good. That's when you when the when the author gets that visceral reaction. That's exactly what I'd like to talk about right there. Yeah. That's why we yeah. talk about these things. Because they can bring this so, kind of passion forth and these these strong opinions because you love these characters so much. Mm -hmm. And and that's where like, you know, my my kind of end of my final thoughts on this book are is that this book could do that to me that this book brought up like emotion and passion and like care for the characters where i talked about earlier i was proud of them 
that's rare for a book for me. I mean, we just finished reading, uh, you know, like a couple weeks ago, we did A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin. Yeah. I loved that book. It was awesome. It was awesome. I never felt that, like, this kind of passion and, and investment in the characters for that, even though I gave that book, like, five damn stars, and, and I loved it. I think it was brilliantly written. It's amazing, but it, it was, it was brilliantly written and amazing in very different ways. Mm. So that's why firefight stands out so much to me. Mm. I love firefight as a sequel. I think if you're looking how to write a sequel, it's an excellent case. He continues themes from story one without being repetitive. He doesn't rely on tropey things. It's awesome character development. Yeah. Yeah. Great um, climax. <clears throat> four to five for me. Only four. Yeah. See, yeah, far, I mean, I, I, I loved Steelheart. And I, as I mentioned last episode, I loved Steelheart so much that I was really struggling not to just spend too much time glowing about it because then it's hard to take someone's mm -hmm. opinion seriously when they're glowing so much about something. It's like, ah, oh, it's just clearly very much to your personal taste. Steelheart was that for me. It was, for me, it was like a 95 out of 100. It was amazing. Firefight for me was equally as good but didn't have as many of those moments that I like that are those, like I like to sit, like, like I call them the oh shit moments and that we'll have to censor that mm -hmm. again, of course. Um, but, <laughs> firefight going through this time around keeping in mind the fact that for some reason drew says that this is that he likes this one more than steelheart which surprised me when we when we first started talking about it on the podcast here i was going into it i was looking for for more things i was doing a much more in-depth analysis i might be persuaded to say that firefight is a better book just with the sheer amount of things that brandon sanderson can do with his characters and, and, and a volume, again, this size, it's still relatively small compared to what he's used to writing. Um, so Firefight, for me, I, I'm, I'm going to say it's right up there with Steelheart for me now. It's it's 95 out of 100. It's a well, so, killer book. There's not much so I can say that's you, bad about it. When you say you could be persuaded that it's a better book, is it a situation where you're like, yeah, I could see how this is a better book, but it's not my favorite? I enjoy this one more, but this one is better written. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll say that as, like, like uh, taking a that. step back and looking at it objectively and just what Sanderson managed to accomplish in that book, I would say, that, I mean, that's what I thought Steelheart was so amazing for. Objectively speaking, what he managed to accomplish in that book, and objectively speaking, what he managed to accomplish in this one, I would say they're still, they're on equal levels now. Okay. But for me, I still just... In terms of personal taste, I just prefer Steelheart because of those yeah. moments like Night Wielder rising out of the roof on the highway to, to interrupt their plans or Night Wielder showing up in Diamond's shop. You know, those those very, very tense moments. Mm -hmm. I just I just there's so much gravity to those scenes that I just I don't know. I didn't really find anything quite like that in Firefight. But I mean Sanderson definitely I would say made up more than made up for it with the character development. It was it was incredible in this book. I mean, that's how you do it right there. So they're, they're yeah, the like, same like, quality, but for different reasons, I guess is how I'll okay. sum that one up. It's so like that, that sentiment that I was kind of aiming for, um, like a good example that we've covered in a previous episode of this podcast, when we were talking about the acts of Cain as a whole, mm. and you asked me what, I can't remember if you said what was my favorite yeah. book or what was the best book. And he says hard um, to choose. And, and where I'm going with that is like, the best written book in the Acts of Cain is almost certainly Blade of Taisha. Yeah. But it's I'm... not my favorite. You know, like I, I would I enjoy reading Heroes Die and Cain Black Knife more than Blade of Tai Shao. Because there are things in Blade of Tai Shao that like don't work for me. You know, some of that like really hardcore violence and and, and like how dark it gets and, and the places his characters go to on their on their character arcs you know even though it's brilliantly written and it's really ambitious and super literary and, and stuff like that whereas like something like Kane black knife is like more of just like a rollicking action story and it's just more fun to read so i could see that like with steelheart being much more of an action-oriented revenge story like a 
plotting and and uh you know the culmination of plans and things like that and getting this like cinematic spectacle that is that is present more so than in firefight not that it's absent from firefight but but it's more about that kind of thing whereas mm. firefight is its impact moments are mostly the quieter character moments the conversations in the hallways yeah. You know, the, the moments in, in their underwater base or mm. David's solitary, you know, struggle underwater or things like that. So it's, it, it you know, this is, this is kind of one of the tough things about, you know, being like a book review podcast is so much of this is subjective, right? You know, yeah. like it's, it's, um, there's no accounting for taste, you know, but that's like, what gives us so much room for discussion though. I mean, if we all agreed on everything, there wouldn't be much of a podcast. It would just be like, yeah, you know, I, I would just might as well just be a lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, but yeah. So uh, on that note, do we want to move into the final draft here? I, I just want to give, uh, would say one more thing, or at least brought oh, sure. to, uh, to the uh, to the front here one final. Uh, since you just brought it up, that scene in the hall, I'm pretty sure it was in the hallway. There was one more metaphor that I wanted to to, to oh. bring up, and. It was Megan who gave us this metaphor, and and sometimes we in these books we still get the really great ones like from Sourcefield. I'm gonna rip you apart like a tissue paper in a hurricane, you know. Yeah, yeah. But with Megan in this scene, I think it was the hallway scene since you just brought it up. It's what made me think of it. Is when she described a certain pistol as being about as accurate as a blind man pissing in an earthquake. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've actually mm-hmm. had a had the glorious opportunity to use that one recently when I saw somebody's <laughs> welds. And uh, I'll Uh-oh. tell you, it does get a positive reaction. <laughs> it's nice, pretty good. Nice. It's a pretty good one. Um, uh, sorry, it, oh, and, and sorry, go ahead. It's funny you bring up that one because I, I actually, I, I forgot to like write a note down, but, but I remember when I read that, I was like, wow, that's like almost cane like <laughs> Yeah, right? It was really, really good. Like it was, it was kind of a shocking thing to read from Brandon <laughs> Sanderson. Like I was like, wow, that is totally something like... That I could see Kane, you know, when he's talking about what a terrible shot he is, you know, that he could say something like, uh, I'm, I'm about as accurate as a Might blind man pissing in an earthquake. Make like, Megan a little more attractive, yeah. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> That's pretty good. So, yeah, uh, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and just I want to you know, shout out to that little nod to Lord of the Rings that we got in this one with the, uh, mm-hmm. when, when Prof says, Lincoln went bad, you know, you call him Merkwood these days. He always did love those sparking books. I was like, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize what the hell he was talking about until like my fourth read through. I was like, oh, ha, huh, cool. So yeah, I just wanted to end on that note. Yeah. All right. So, um, uh, so the final draft, uh, Jared, yeah. why don't you kick us off? All right. So mine is unfortunately not thematic today, but, uh, <laughs> this is from Max Line and Brewing. It is an Irish red. Ooh. Very tasty. Irish red. Max Line's good. Yeah, this is uh, the first thing I've had from them in quite a while, actually. Yeah, so Max Line Brewing Company is this tiny, tiny little uh, craft brewery in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, it's like, there's, so, for people who don't know the city, there's like a, a railroad that goes, like, north-south, uh, straight through the middle of the city. And right next to it, there's a, a bus route that was recently built, um, you know, like city infrastructure stuff. And it's called the Max. And so that bus route is the Max line. And this brewery is right off of that, um, kind of hidden in, like, behind a shopping center. <laughs> and it's it really is, like, kind of a, you know, like a hidden gem in Fort Collins. They do, mm-hmm. like, really good stuff. They have, uh, they have a couple of, um, like, German beers. Their Scotch Ale is awesome. Uh, scotch Ale? Oh, my God. Yeah. The guy at the at Fish's... Told me that they're coming out with something new like next weekend. Oh my Ooh. god! Nice. So, anyways, yeah. I'm still hung up on uh, Scotch yeah. ale. Holy crap! Uh, <laughs> not necessarily brewed with Scotch. It's like Scottish style, like Scotch in that sense. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. It's like like a wee heavy is is like the. Oh, I had a wee heavy name. once. It was so effing good. I had it in Montreal actually. Oh, nice. Yeah. It was so. Um, it, was, it was called Le Castor. It's like a twenty dollar bottle. It was like a half liter. Whoa. It was amazing. This is in the hotel. It was, oh, it was so good. Sorry, uh, didn't want <laughs> yeah, to drop yeah. them. So um, I just uh, take her forward then. 
Uh, yeah, what, what are you doing over there, Rob? <clears throat> well, I have found this amazing new drink. Uh, it's great for the organs. It's really refreshing. Um, zero calories, believe it or not. It's called water. Nice. Um, Whoa. <laughs> I'm drinking water. I'm actually specifically, I'm drinking Fiji water right now. Because I'm just, I'm back on a keto diet as of today. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll probably be, be bringing the occasional uh, spot of alcohol onto the show. But when you're trying to limit like your carb intake, beer is like about the worst thing you could yeah, possibly yeah. drink. <laughs> so, and I've, I've done some research, you know, for some totally selfless justification on, on the <laughs> subject of drinking. And uh, it turns out that if, if you're going to try and limit your, limit your sugars and your carbs, uh, a dark liquor is the way to go which for me is perfect because I'm a whiskey dude. I'm a scotch dude. So I'll probably be bringing All something right. closer to those lines onto the shows in the future. All right. Um, Definitely. But yeah, I'm, I'm drinking some bitchin' water right now. Fiji water, way to go, man. I, I've discovered that there are actually better waters. I would have laughed if you had told me that before. <laughs> totally are. Uh, oh, oh, trust me. We live in Colorado. We yeah. have, like, the best <laughs> <What is> water. <laughs> we have the best water, seriously. You mean, like, ground, have, like, like, like groundwater? Like, Yes. Yeah, like mm. like the just drinking the tap water out of your faucet in the kitchen sink. Ooh, I don't is, know. London, like Ontario amazing. has has some really good water there too, man. It's mm. oh, mm. that's nectar of the gods. That stuff. Anyway, what are you drinking, <laughs> but, Drew? Uh, yeah, so I am drinking a black raspberry saison brewed with Britannomyces from Anchorage Brewing Company, and this is actually the second time I brought in an Anchorage. I was going to say you. Uh, I recognize Anchorage already. Yeah, I I did. Um, I think. Uh, ghosts in their eyes for I think the second memory called Empire episode, which was their uh, Imperial IPA brewed with Britannomyces. Sure, yeah. Um, That's why. But it's yeah, so this is this is an eight percent saison, uh, you know, farmhouse ale. Uh, super fruity, super funky, a little vinegary in the finish. Um, it's not not like the best beer I've ever had, but it's it's fine. Um, but it is called. Easy evil, easy evil. Oh, <laughs> oh man, oh that's a that's a face palmer right there. I like, it. I like it. I appreciated I, what you did. I'm there. psyched that I'm still like able to find <laughs> beers that are thematically. Appropriate. I don't know. Has there been an episode where you haven't had a thematic? Uh, the very well, there's first, been a couple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. The very first episode I brought in La Folie, and then I think I from had... New Belgian Brewery. Yeah, from New Belgium. <laughs> Look um, at me. And then... Nice. Nice. I know, right? I think I had another one maybe for like oh, I don't remember. One of the cane ones maybe like I couldn't like I ran out of time and I didn't sure. have Yeah, cuz I remember, I remember but, hearing the episode recently, yeah. Yeah. Um but but yeah, I you know, I intended And there was a great this... time. Sorry, when Jared beat you though. I have to bring that one up on oh, Skyward. Yeah. Ooh, yes. Yeah, bringing yeah. The fearless youth. That was remember that one? That was a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, like, I, I intend to keep, keep finding thematically appropriate beers for as, <laughs> as many books as I can. I'm actually a little scared cause, uh, uh, you know, we've been talking about, you know, in the next couple of months here, kicking off the wheel of time. And I know those books like the back of my hand. Oh yeah. Know, and I can't wait to get ahead, those. Thinking ahead. I'm like, the black. I have no clue what beers I'm going to bring in for some of those books. That's like, a good point though. When you <laughs> so. Huh. Oh, there's just so much to draw from, though. Oh my god, I'm worried that our Wheel of Time episodes are going to be some like time to plan four it out. hour episodes. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we'll see. But <laughs> yeah, it's just going to be it's like so much. Even if we make them like two hours each, it's going to be so much that we have to not talk about. And it's going to be hard. Yeah. Uh, so. um, but anyway, we're, uh, we're, we're getting I'm, pretty I'm long on this book. one for especially for a, a YA. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So this has been episode twenty three. 23 episodes. Uh, yeah. Nobody likes you when you're 23. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of Inking Out Loud. And um, next up, we're going to be doing Calamity by Brandon Sanders. Yeah. The conclusion of The Reckoners. Uh, um, and then if you uh, join our Patreon, if you support us on there, um, you'll uh, get a couple of the tiers. You have the opportunity to get access to our short story episodes and just a couple of days after this episode goes live actually a couple of days before um we will have our short episode covering the reckoner short story mitosis so if you want to hear what we have to say about um our first brandon sanderson short story the first of many that we will cover on this podcast 
uh, check us out on Patreon. Consider supporting us yes. so that we can pay our sound engineer and our artist and you know pay for hosting our podcast. Yeah, and it's worth noting that uh, short stories aren't the only thing that you get as a bonus, depending on your Patreon level. We have all kinds of bonus stuff planned, um, so just uh, check us out there, for sure. Absolutely. And yeah, so for uh, for this episode, I am your host, Drew McCaffrey, joined by my co-host, Rob Santos. What's up? And once again, our special guest, Jared Livingston. See you, everyone. Mr. And Jared we'll Livingston. catch you next time. Mr. Jared <laughs> <laughs> Peace out, everybody. Goodbye.